So we're going to be studying his word, and I'm going through the book of Acts on Wednesday nights, and we are right now in chapter 19 of Acts, and we're going to finish that out today, book of Acts. And so, by the way, I have entitled this evening's message, Let God Handle the Riots. Let God handle the riots. That kind of already gives you an idea here of just how great God is, that we can even say something like that. You've got riots in your life, whatever a riot, however you might define it, give it over to the Lord. He'll handle it. God will do that for you because he is so in love with you, because you, Christian, are ladies, you are his daughter, and he cares about you more than any earthly father could. You take whatever issue you might have before your Father in heaven, and he will handle it. Hey, brothers in Christ, same thing. Sometimes we can get a little prideful because, you know, we're guys. But um, he's our dad. He's our father, and he wants to handle those. He wants us to bring those right to his throne, right there. Call on him. Call on his power and not our own, and he will handle them. Let God handle the riot. I'll tell you what, let's pray. Looks like you guys are all there. Let's pray, and then we'll get into God's word together, Lord. We are so thankful. You are our Father in heaven, God, and we have um, an opportunity, a privilege to come together as your family, this, the body of Christ, we who are brothers and sisters. And we are so grateful that this evening we get to fellowship together in your love, and we get to worship you with just all of our hearts because you're worthy of it. And now, God, we get to grow together in your word. We get, Lord, to feed on your word. And we pray this evening, Lord, please nourish us. God, that as we read through, that they're not just words on a page, Lord, or on a screen, Lord, but that they just are They're alive, they're living, they're active. Lord, that they would penetrate our hearts and our minds and our lives. God, that it would change us, mold us, make us more, Lord, like you. That is is our call, that is our desire, to become more and more like you, Jesus. And Lord, too, if there's anybody here this evening that you've brought and they don't have a personal relationship with you, God, we pray tonight you will change them. Touch that heart that today would be the night, today it would be the day of their salvation. We love you, Lord. We pray those words by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you guys, in Acts chapter 19, now last week, I didn't quite get as far as I thought I was going to get um, through. What I've actually decided as I studied and I prayed is that I'm just going to take what we call a cursory look at the rest of last week's passage because I really do want to get right in. The Holy Spirit just led me to let's get right into verse 21. So here's what we'll do. We'll read Acts. You follow with me, but let me just get here real quickly. Um, Acts chapter 19. And what I want to do is read from verse 11 to verse 20. Okay, so follow with me. It says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Remember, we talked about that. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. Jesus, I, I know that, that word know there, meaning that he knows almost in an intimate sense. There is no doubt I know who Jesus is, and I know his nature. He says, so this Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize. I have seen this man, Paul, and he basically, his money is where his mouth is. He talks the talk, and he walks the walk, and it all has to do with Jesus. 
But then this demon goes, but <laughs> who are you? <laughs> you, who, who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all. Don't you love that word? In the newer uh, translations, it says mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. That's, I like the way they say that as well. It was set on high. It was acknowledged as king of kings. It was acknowledged. Jesus was acknowledged to be who he was proclaimed as. God the Son, the Savior, the Lord of all. He was extolled. You guys, when you're living your life, don't just tell people about Jesus. Extol Jesus. Huh? Do it that way. You want to extol Jesus when you tell them, oh, I'm a Christian. I come to church. I learn. I grow in the word. Or, you know, I, I see that you have, you know, some issue going on in your life. Can I, can I pray for you? Because I get to pray my prayers in the name of Jesus. Jesus, he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life. I would just love to be able to do that. When you have an opportunity, extol your master. Okay, so this became known uh, and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing, and divulging their practices. So that was a reference to those believers who were sort of sitting on the fence. Those who kind of said, I'm into Jesus, but they had not lived a life that said, I live for Jesus. And once they had seen what had happened, they were like, okay, there's no question here. And I think, you guys, the Holy Spirit shows this to you and to me to basically say it this way. God doesn't want fence sitters. You are either with him or not with him. This is the way life is supposed to be for a Christian. We don't sit on the fence. We don't hold back and we don't wait. We know that he is who he says he is. We know that we have been transformed the way only Jesus, oh, the one we extol, the one how he can change us, and so we're all in. We take up our crosses. We follow him. We revere him and we love him and we consider him even over our own. In fact, we're supposed to love him to the degree that it's called hating the others, wife and children and, you know, and everybody else. So it says here, some people in essence got convicted and they said, okay, then we're in. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That's imperfect. What that means is it was never satisfied. It's so cool the way it's written there, you guys. Verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase there was never an end to its continuation. That's how it's written there. That means that the power of the Lord, man, when they extolled him and, we, and the Holy Spirit filled them and they were walking in the power of the Spirit, basically what it implies is this. When the Christians made an effort to obey the Lord, God honored it. Something changed, something happened. Somebody was one to the Lord. Some prayer, a quote, worked. Something happened where it was obvious Jesus was worthy of being called Savior and Lord. Okay, that's the, that's the story in Ephesus. That's what's been going on this, this whole time. That's where we're supposed to get so excited and say, well, if it can happen in Ephesus, it can happen in Prescott. And it can happen in my neighborhood. It can happen in my living room because I know there are some people in our church who live with those who don't believe in Jesus. And the fact of the matter is it can happen in your living room. It can happen at your workplace. It can happen in all of these. But you guys, you see the common element? It's you. 
The common element, it's me. It's to be able to walk in the power of the Spirit because we are faith-filled. Man, we know that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's why. That's why God will use you. That's why God will honor those prayers, okay? Honor those efforts. So here we go. Things are happening in Ephesus. Man, it says continued to increase, which means it was never satisfied. It just had to increase more and then increase more and then increase more. Look at verse 21. <clears throat> now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, that is Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. That's an interesting detail that the Lord wanted you and me to see. Because you got to understand something. Paul didn't actually do anything personally. See, because you might read this and it almost sounds like Paul got his briefcase, got his suitcase and started walking the road out of here and going toward, um, uh, toward Macedonia and Achaia. But that's not what it says. Um, we caught that though. It actually talks more about the Lord doing a work in Paul and Paul hearing the voice of the Lord and saying, well then, okay, Lord, if you're leading me in that way, I will go. It's a consistent message that you see in Paul's life. It's a consistent message that you see in the early church's life. What is it to be led by the Lord? Now, very specifically, that is to say, to be led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit who comes into you, the Holy Spirit who leads you in your worship of Jesus, the Holy Spirit who leads you in studying God's Word. You know, when I am up here and I'm teaching you, here is what kind of the way I see it, is that you guys all have your, you know, your Holy Spirit filters right here, you know, at your ears and right here at your heart. And as these words are going toward you, the Lord is leading you in the words that I say. He's, he's, he's pointing you in your own mind. You notice sometimes how maybe a verse comes to your memory. I'll say something and suddenly some proverb will just pop up in your mind. Or, or some incident where you prayed with somebody four weeks ago and something happened will just like It'll just come up. To me, that is the Holy Spirit sort of edifying and, and, and helping your growth experience right along. It's always, you guys, our, our, our lives in Christ are always led by the Spirit. Your life and mine are to be led and we're supposed to be hungry for that. We're supposed to be desirous of that. That's what the Lord wanted of his church. When he left or before he left, what did he say? He said, wait. He said, wait, I don't even want you to work. I don't want you to go out there and tell people about me. I mean, isn't that something? Jesus actually declared himself to be the living, the one who was prophesied, the Messiah. And what? He still told them, wait. That's how important being led by the Spirit of God is in our lives. So what does your prayer life look like in the morning? Make sure it includes something like this, and Holy Spirit, lead me. Lord, I yield to your leading. I desire to, to hear your voice. Point me, show me, declare to me, lead me. What's another good prayer? Convict me. When I start going astray, draw me back, Lord. These are the prayers that Christians are to say in mourning. Actually, what am I saying mourning? We're just supposed to say this kind of stuff day after day after day. Um, let, me, let me read you a few verses that we're going to have on the screen. In the book of Acts and chapter 16, we taught this, I think, <laughs> a couple of months ago. But do you remember the leading of the Spirit in this one? And they went through the region of Pergia and Galatia, 
having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia? Remember, that's mind-boggling. I mean, he only gives us one sentence, but that's mind-boggling. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Remember, by the way, that's a Trinitarian apologetic, a defense of the Trinity right there, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God. Hmm. That puts kind of Jesus and God in the same in the same camp. But that much so, the Spirit is to lead us that you had mighty Apostle Paul and his life as an evangelist, as a missionary, as a church planter, as a teacher, all of that literally change. And he didn't do it on a whim. He did it by the leading of the Spirit. He wrote to the Roman church, look at this one, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led are sons. We are, to, we are to do it because we get to do it, and it's a part of your identity. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our own course. <laughs> you think the Lord really wants to lead you? You bet he does. Does he really want to lead me? You bet that he does. Does he so want to be in your life, controlling your life, leading you in your life, that he basically says bluntly, look, without you, I mean, without me, <laughs> you really ain't got a life. You really don't have the path or the vision that you think that you have. It needs to come from me. You know, that's just a very, a very loving and intimate father. That's a God who, who has a purpose for you. You know, uh, Christians, one of the things about, um, one of the things that you extol about your faith is how valuable you are to God. It is one of, I think, one of the imperatives when it comes to communicating your faith I think to say that God loves you that much, people are lonely. People are confused about a God that they think they have to earn his favor. People are easily, easily depressed because they're devalued so easily, so quickly. But to be told that God loves you so much that he wants you to be his daughter or his son, I mean, wow. And not only that, he doesn't want to leave you alone. He wants in on every piece of your life. That's how valuable you are to him. Those kinds of things really just drive, uh, bring a person, bring a person up. They draw a person toward the Lord all the more. They, they refresh a person. They change a person's perspective. I don't know why I'm just saying to non-believers, that's something we even say to each other. Because sometimes somebody will come up to me and say, Raj, I just feel so depressed. I don't know, I just feel like there's nothing. I, who am I? You know, some people come and say that. I, honestly, you guys, sometimes I'll even start like toying with that idea. I mean, praise God, the Holy Spirit convicts me of it. But just as a man, it's easy to fall into that trap, isn't it? We just have to remember, you are so valuable. I am so valuable to God. He wants to be my dad and he wants to have everything to do with every part of my life. Now the event, let, let's read that again. This is where this all came from. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now there's an interesting analysis of what happened there. Here are the questions that come. How did Paul know it was the Spirit telling him? Like, we don't see here that it says, and Paul heard the voice of God, and God said. Notice the wording there? It says, resolved in the Spirit, and your Spirit should be a capital S. Okay, resolved in the Holy Spirit. Not just in His Spirit, but in that connection made when you are a child of God. So how did it go? Well, 
there's going to have to be a little bit of speculation here because it doesn't tell us. But I don't think we'd be too far off course if we said it like this. Obviously, he reflected on the word. Right? Paul knew the word pretty well. <laughs> of course, the Holy Spirit uh, wrote some of the word through him, which is what we study. Nevertheless, he knew the word. What else? He was a yielded and submissive man. He was ready to be called or drawn to God's will, however, whenever, wherever. Remember all those instances? So he was very yielded. So number one, he knew the word. Number two, he was very yielded, very submissive. Number three, uh, you could put the word humble there. How about that, the word humble, the word humble. Um, what else? We would be able to surmise that he was very prayerful. Definitely. He was a very prayerful man. We know that he would spend, he said, I prayed for you. You know, night and day, I prayed for you. So he was a very prayerful man. Here's another one. He was faithful and bold in his faithfulness. What do we mean by that? When Paul sensed, when Paul felt like this was the right way to go, you know what he did? He went. It's that step of faith. It's that step of faith. It's saying, Lord, I've sort of, I've considered all that you've allowed me to consider, your word, through prayer. You know, I would even say it this way too, you guys. Sometimes we need counsel one to another. The Bible says that we should seek counsel from one another. If, if one of you felt like um, you were to take another job, my counsel to you would be, did you bring it up with other believers? Did you go to some friends? Did you go to some people that you really trust? Did you come to church leadership and say, listen, Rod, you know what? I feel like the Lord's really calling me to take a job here or to switch and do that instead. I would say that's, that's a wise thing, right? We know that, that in, um, uh, in the multitude, we know that God grants us wisdom. He says, without the multitude of counselors, what? <laughs> Plans, they fail. So that would be another thing you would say. So you guys, what we do is we put all the elements together and we say, that would be me right there. Raj resolved in the spirit. That means there was prayer. There was the word. There was prob probably discussion with others. Um, when, I, when I make decisions regarding leading this church, I can tell you this to the best of my ability. I believe that I resolve in the spirit to do those things. I don't know too many decisions that I've made that have to do with this campus or with our ministries or anything else where I've just said, here, let me, um, heads, yeah, tails, no. <laughs> it, it doesn't go like that. And uh, I will speak to other guys, you know, the other pastors, uh, the elders, they come over to my house. We meet together at my house um, at the beginning of every month and we'll talk stuff, whatever. But these are the way things go. And that's the way things go for our lives, okay? And I'm, I'm glad I have the opportunity because I've been asked this several times. What does it mean that Paul resolved in the spirit? So these would be the things, Christian. Remember, we're always led by the spirit. Okay, so let's continue on now. And By the way, okay, okay, I got to say this too. Notice that he knows that he's going to go. Paul knows that one moment coming, he's going to get out of Ephesus and he's going to make his way on to Jerusalem and ultimately to, to Rome. You know the book of Acts? The book of Acts is really the journey of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Starts in Jerusalem and it's going to end in Rome. That's, that's, the, that's the journey of the gospel. And Paul is told right here by the Spirit in one way or another, hey, you're going to get to Rome, by the way. Remember I started you off? Well, your end is coming. I just need you to stay faithful. Follow my plan and my will for your life. <laughs> so he sends his two guys. He sends Timothy and Erastus to, like, prepare the way. And by, they go to Corinth, okay, Corinth. They're going to go to that church there and basically say, hey, uh, Paul's coming. <laughs> get ready because Paul's coming, and Paul is able to do great ministry to Corinth. So he sends those guys. You know what? You might have to make decisions like that too. Maybe it's a bold step of faith is to affect another person's life. 
Maybe a bold something in your life doesn't really have to do with you personally, but you are supposed to walk up to somebody and say, you know, the Lord has put something on my heart that I want to tell you about. And then you tell them. Now, you got to be careful because you don't get to have any expectations. I, I have had people literally in the past walk up to me and say, I have a vision that the church, this is this is when I first took over. I have a vision. The church is supposed to give away half of all its income. Every time income comes, every half of it, just right off the top, 50% it should go. God told me that. And God said that that's how this church is going to get blessed. What am I supposed to do? Well, uh, okay, since God told you, here we go. And then we can't pay the electric bill, the water bill, or any other bill. Those kinds of things we have to be careful of. But I just want to let you know, part of it might be not just directly for you. I might need a word from you. You might need a word from me. We just step out and we do it. So we're led by the Spirit. We know how we're led by the Spirit. Now life goes on for Paul. Check this out. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way... For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from the business we have, from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people. Oh. Saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come, uh, may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. And that she may even be deposed from her magnificence she whom all Asia and the world worship. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Oh, that way. Your way should be capitalized, the W, the way. Oh, that way, those Christians. That's how, remember, we talked about, that's how the Christians were referred to. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ made the undeniable claim that he is the exclusive path because he didn't say a way, did he? He said, no, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. He made the claim. People hear it, and they have a decision to make. Do I accept it? Do I believe that? Do I receive that? Or do I reject it? And do I suffer the consequence? Do I say, yes, I believe, Jesus, that you are the way, and the truth and the life, that it's only through you that I will receive forgiveness of my sin. I believe that I receive, that I repent of my sin. And I receive the forgiveness that is found only in you. I believe that you are the Savior, the exclusive one. Be my Lord, my Savior. You're my master, you're my king. Then you have a relationship with God forever. Or you reject it. And the Bible, it says that you will die in your sin. There's consequence for sin. And we know what that means in the end, eternity separated from God. And that is an eternity in hell. People don't like that message, do they? Anybody you've shared that message with ever um, not appreciated it? <laughs> That's me putting it nicely. Uh, I know I have had people threaten me because I have shared that message. I've had terrible posts on Facebook. I've had emails sent to me, um, had a letter sent to me at this church one time, have had to, 
you know, kind of back off because of people who have been in my face telling me how offended they are that I shared the fact, not that Jesus is a way, but that he is the way. Oh, we are in the midst of perhaps the most narcissistic society ever. I think so. I think it's, you know, the all about me thing. <laughs> I think uh, we can safely say this is it. This is supreme so far as far as narcissism goes, self-centeredness. And it's all about my desire and my choice. And so the gospel message is, has become another, te- another layer that the gospel message that you and I share has to drill through. Of course, it's the power of God. But still, there it is. Uh, what people will say and have said is, you know what, that's good for you. But that's not the way I see it. For me, God is, and then they fill in some blank. And they've done it. Uh, Islam is my way. Um, Latter-day Saints is my way. Or some other way is my way. And, you know, they would be okay with me if I just said, okay, you know, I'm a Christian. I just wanted you to know. I, I choose Jesus. That, that's my way. Because they would just see me then what? As, 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 a, as a fellow religious person. I'm just religious. Hey, Rod's got religion. Good for him. So do I. But that's not what Raj claims. He claims exclusivity. He claims relationship. And he says it can only happen through Jesus. This is why people are in my face sometimes. If you were just religious, they'd like you. But if you're into this relationship through Jesus thing, there are going to be some people who don't like you. And you know what? That's the way it goes, doesn't it? That's just the way it is. And in fact... What it's supposed to do is make us do this because that tells me that there's some power behind my message. It means that there's some force on the other side that doesn't like what I'm saying and so wants to fight it. To me, that just adds to the substance of my message when there's that kind of animosity, when there's that kind of resistance, huh? Boy, we don't fight just against flesh and blood. These are principalities and powers. This is darkness This is led by one who is, oh, so not in love with God, but hates God and hates all those who are children of that God. No, I'm not a follower of some way. I'm a follower of the way, and so are you. Everything about this way affects, I mean, he affects everything, mind, body, soul, spirit, demeanor, (laughs) identity, all things, because he is the way. He places a wonderful call, an eternal call on your life, which you can grasp because he is the way, not a way. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Look, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures we should live in this world with we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness and devotion to God. The way means you're off of that path and you're on to a brand new one. This is what Titus was saying of Christ. This is what Paul was preaching in cities like Ephesus and all around him. The way, exclusivity. I, let it be something that you preach. Let it be something that you say in love but you say it with boldness, beloved. You preach it with boldness. You preach it, though, knowing that there's power in your message. You preach it with confidence. You preach it, you teach it, you tell it. You let, you let them make the decision, but you don't withhold it. Make sure to tell them about it. Here in Ephesus, the problem was that gospel message, you know what? It was affecting business. It was affecting commerce. It was affecting the economy of the city. And that, oh, money, come on now, money. Boy, uh, money and Jesus don't necessarily mix because people tend to want money more than they want Jesus. And right here is one thing that you see happening. This gospel, you know what he's doing? Remember now, Ephesus, that's the place of the temple of Artemis, right? That's Diana. That's, that's the temple, the sex goddess. That's the, one of the seven 
right? One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the Temple of Diana up there with all those columns, six stories high. I mean, magnificent structure. Oh, people, people worshipped by giving money and sleeping with a temple prostitute. It was a very popular religion, especially for men. <laughs> it, it was one of their favorites. That was the religion they liked. Artemis was considered the goddess of fertility, uh, the goddess of um, childbirth. Uh, she, if you've ever seen the idol, and I meant to get you a picture, but if you've ever seen a, temp, a statue of Artemis, um, 20 breasts. <laughs> Must have been hard to get a bra for her, but 20 right here. <laughs> and, and, and it was just to, you know, to sort of push that whole lust thing and all that other stuff, um, archaeologists have actually dug up a lot of these trinkets and a lot of these statues and whatnot. Very popular, very worth a lot of money today if you happen to own one of those. But people wanted them. The people back then, they bought them, lots of them. They put them in various parts of their homes. Um, <laughs> They put them on the dashboards of their chariots. You know what I mean? They, they rode on. It was one of those things where they believed this thing had power, man. This is, this is something that we got to have. And so there was a lot of money associated with Artemis. There was a lot, a lot of commerce associated with Artemis. People came from all over the world to, to worship this goddess. And so what gets noticed? Well, this gospel is getting in the way. What is this Jesus Christ thing? He's getting in our way. Paul is actually telling people that he's not, or that she's not a real God. Paul is saying that these hand-formed gods, because remember, Ephesus, lots of hand-formed gods. These hand-formed gods, these are not really gods. You know, you can just hear Paul quoting the Old Testament. You can hear him saying things like, you know, God hates God is a jealous God. God is a God who wants to be the exclusive one. He is the one true God. And he hates that any man worships an idol. Can you just not hear Paul just saying it? He's just saying it. I think to some people, he looked them in the eye and he said, listen, God doesn't want you to worship something false. And then I think he had him stand kind of in front of groups like this and say, listen, God does not want you to worship anything false. He is a jealous God. No idolatry. And he quotes that too. This is um, something that gets them all riled up. You preach the truth and you're going to rile up those who don't like the truth. Anyway, so in this case, it's the fact that people were receiving the gospel message. And you know what? The first thing they did, what did it say in the verses above this? It said they, they were bringing their stuff and they were throwing it in and they were making a big bonfire out of their books and all of that incantation stuff. And they were getting rid of these things. And not only were they that, they weren't passive. Like they didn't just throw it in the fire and walk and go home. You know what they did? They were the kinds of people where they threw it in the fire and they said, let me tell you what I just did. And they would go and tell somebody why it is that they threw it in the fire. Because Ephesus became like an evangelical center it became one of those places where Christianity sort of, you know, went out from. Talk about a ripple effect. It was there. And so not only were they just getting rid of their own statues and not buying new ones, but they were telling you, get rid of your statues and don't buy any new ones. You had all of these commerce people, business people come from other parts of the world. Hey, 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 listen, that statue, you know, on your chariot dashboard, Get it off. Throw it away. Let me tell you the truth. And so they were starting to evangelize to all these people. And so you had guys like this, Demetrius and these other silversmiths saying, what? Like, no. No, that's not okay. Now, I want to I wanna bring something to your attention a little bit off from here. I want you to consider something about Demetrius. And it's based on a verse that I'm going to get to in just a couple of minutes. But here, stay with me on this one. So, oh, Demetrius 
never mentions that he is spiritually offended. Read his if you read his text, he is not the spiritually offended one. You're going to see that some of the silversmiths say, you know, great is our Artemis of the Ephesians and all that other stuff. But Demetrius very specifically brings up the fact that my business has been messed up. That my commerce has been messed up. It's like he's kind of dry spiritually. It's like he's not there. He doesn't care spiritually about this thing. And I'm absolutely sure that Paul had said, hey, Demetrius, sir, may I tell you about Jesus? You know, at some point, Paul must have come up to Demetrius and said, may I tell you what I call the good news of Jesus? We call it the gospel. And he probably said something, but Demetrius doesn't indicate that spiritually speaking, there was an effect on him. I want to tell you an observation, okay? So, so uh, let's see. In Judaism, okay, uh, a rabbi, a spiritual leader, would have disciples. Young men would follow him. In fact, that was the model that Jesus took. Jesus, the rabbi. Jesus was the teacher, the leader. And he had men who followed. And what a rabbi did to his disciples, that's what we call the followers, disciples, is he would spend his time pouring into them, teaching them the spiritual truths, uh, teaching them practical stuff, how to go about your normal day, how to even speak. They would even teach them how to speak. They would teach them points of inflection, inflection or keeping things quiet and those kinds of things. They would do everything. They would try to instill Basically, what they wanted to do was have this young man be become him, an imitator, an imitator of himself. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said this, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough, what, for the disciple to be like his teacher. That's what Jesus was referring to, that whole model of teacher and, and disciple. He says, eventually, this guy is going to bring these guys up to himself. He's going to fade away. Then these guys are going to have other guys. And that cycle just goes and goes and goes and goes. So um, I was watching a video, uh, The Western Wall. Some of you have been, you know, I've never been, <laughs> I've never been to Israel. Um, but Missy and I have a trip planned in March to, of next year to go. So it'll be my first, my first visit there. But so I was watching a video and it was of the Western Wall. You know, that's where you write your little prayer requests and they roll them up and then they, they put them in the little cracks, the little spaces between the bricks there on the wall. And so if you watch a video, let's say you just go onto YouTube, you will watch some men standing there and they might have a book and you know, they're, they're praying. And what they do is they, as they pray, they're like bowing forward like this. It's like they're doing sit-ups standing up. It's like they're just really going for it, right? And they're doing this. You've seen that probably before. You look 15 feet away and there's another man and he's doing the same thing except he's going like this and he's going sideways. You know, it's like he wants to get these, the, the handles, you know, on the, on the tummy. <laughs> he wants to exercise the handles so he's going like this the whole time. And then you'll see another guy. It's like he's got the hula hoop, you know, and he's going like this. It's pretty entertaining to watch these guys. But uh, so here's the question. Why? I mean, they're all standing there praying. They're all going to the same God. Why is one guy getting the handles done? Why is one guy spinning the hula hoop? And why does one guy want to get a six pack? It's not a bad exercise. <laughs> the answer is because that's how they were taught by their rabbi. See, they were all taught that prayer is a necessity. I mean, come on, in Judaism, prayer. But the method of the prayer happened to be that that man learned it from another man that he called his master, his rabbi, and the master said, when you go to the, when you say your prayers, you go like this. And it's just, you see it right there in front of you. Wow, that's what it, that's what it looks like. Man, they're just like their master. They don't even care what the other guy's doing. They learned it. They're going with it. That's what Jesus wanted to do to his men. Jesus never wanted his men to look to the left or to look to the right. Jesus wanted his men 
to look at him. The demeanor, right? The way of speak, the way to act, the way to love, the way to say no, the way to agree. I mean, just, just example after example of just being a person is here. And it was a model that the young men all knew. They all understood what it was that Jesus wanted. And we know theologically, we know doctrinally, we know actually very practically, the word imitate was used several times in the New Testament. Again, it's all that mindset. He who is your master, he who is your leader, be like him. Be an imitator. Now, where am I going with that in terms of Demetrius? Well, Psalm 115, okay, this will be on the screen. Psalm 115, beginning at verse four. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. You understand that was spiritual in its essence, right? That's a, that's a spiritual message right there. He's talking about those who choose to follow the fake gods. Those who he even refers to those literally who make them. He is talking about the silversmiths there. He is talking about those who actually buy the statues and go, oh, you know, dear Artemis, I praise you and I worship you, that kind of stuff. But he says straight up, those who make them become like them. And he's talking about these lifeless statues. They've got, now they got eyes, but they can't see. They got ears, but they can't hear. They got mouths, but they can't speak. It's, it's, a, it's an ultimate deadness in the spirit. There's an ultimate deadness. It's a, not even dullness doesn't say it. It's just lifeless. It's deadness. If you notice what happened in Demetrius' response, he's the guy who had no spiritual response. He only cared about the money. Everybody else cared spiritually. I already told you that. You know, great is Arda, Ar Artemis, but not this guy. I think it's just very interesting that that's the guy who incites the riot, the man who was just straight up dead the man who is like his master. Okay, that's kind of where that fits in. Demetrius became a follower of a lifeless thing, of a dead thing. He became like it. He had, no, he had nothing deep down. He, 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 doesn't, even, he doesn't even tell them, um, Paul insulted my Lord with his Lord Je Jesus. He said that his Jesus is better than my Artemis. Instead, he just goes, hey, you guys, our wealth, it's getting stolen. This is one thing that you, Christian, can observe. Observe that in people. How do they respond to what you say? And I'm telling you, if you keep a, if you keep a spiritual eye, you will, you, will, you will know a lot without even asking a question. When you hear them speak, when you hear them answer your gospel message, you will know. I, I can tell. I can tell if I'm talking to a Jehovah's Witness out in the grocery store. Not because they knocked on my door and all that other stuff, but because there's something about the way they, they, they let themselves off that I understand who their master is. Uh, the, the, the Mormon, same thing. Or an atheist. Oh, I can totally read an atheist. But these kinds of things. Where am I going with all of this then? In a very practical sense. I want you to be very spiritually sensitive to another person's master. Now, given if Jesus isn't your master, Satan is your master, okay? Given. But we're talking about the little nuance thing. How is it? Is it Satan's avenue called the watchtower? Is it Satan's called the LDS? Is it Satan's called whatever else? Because if you remember in our apologetic series, one of the things I told you is you do have to be sensitive. How you speak, how you approach matters. You're going to approach a watchtower person differently than you're going to approach a Mormon person, differently than you're going to approach an atheist. And I want, to, I want to put some of that burden on us. 
you know, take it upon yourself to learn a few of these things. What do you say when, when they come to your door? What do you say when you know that they, when they don't have the white shirts with the blue ties, although I'm not sure if they still do that, but white shirts and the blue ties, what are you going to say to them versus what you're going to say to the people who come with their little bag of watchtower materials? Do you have something? <laughs> I hope you do. I don't, wanna, I don't want anybody in this place to say, no, Raj, I don't know what to say. But in case you do not know, we got our stuff on YouTube, lots of stuff online. Check it out. Okay, so let's see. Where was I with this? God allows you and I to discern who one's master is. And based on who one's master is, we are able to, to share as they may need to be shared with. All right. Something to consider the next time you read this about this guy, Demetrius, and, and all that goes on there. Now, so as far, then the next thing that happens here, so Demetrius tells them, hey, we're out of money. I mean, he's taking our wealth and whatnot. It says this. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. Oh, what a bummer. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs uh, who were friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Hmm. <laughs> Remember how with Paul, it's, it's either riot or revival. Uh, <laughs> always is. In this case, it went revival and then riot. But that's it, right? They say hanging out with Paul would have been a real riot. And that's, the, that's what would have happened basically everywhere you go, including here. So they have this huge theater. You ever seen, again, I can't believe I didn't get you guys these pictures. Maybe you can picture that, that theater there, right, that they have there in Ephesus. And so they say thousands and thousands of people could fit in it. I've heard numbers as high as 25,000. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure about that. Still, thousands. And the acoustic engineering, man, oh, man, amazing. I have spoken to pastors who've stood on the stage and given a message with their people way back, and they speak normal voice like this. They're just speaking like this. And they say that they could hear it all the way through. Like it just echoed. I, I want to go there, too, one of these days. So acoustically, the engineering, the way they had it in, um, built was marvelous. It was a marvelous structure. So they all go there. So you can imagine when it says uproar, the sound must have been all the more amplified. So I want you to think serious drama here. That's not just people going, oh, come on, Paul, stop. <laughs> no, no, Jesus. Give me a no. Give me a Jesus. Give me a no, Jesus. These people were yelling and screaming and mad. And then these poor guys, Gaius and Aristarchus, come along and they get dragged in. It says that there's nothing but spiritual confusion there. What I just so love about this is Paul is being a pastor and a father. Paul is being a Christian brother. Call it, uh, Paul is being a courageous fella because even with thousands of people there in essence saying, the blood of Paul, that's kind of the way I imagine. The blood of Paul, we want to see the blood of Paul. He wants to go in. He, he knows that there are these two brothers of his and they're suffering and he is willing to go into a room where in essence people are saying we want his blood and he's willing to go in. That's, that's courageous, isn't it? That's the kind of faith and courage that every believer is called to exercise. I mean, can you imagine walking? Let's just, you're just walking along and you're walking by some big door of, I don't know, a a big store that you can't necessarily see into, and you just hear your name with the word blood. Roger's blood! Roger's blood! You know, I'm not going to probably turn into the door and say, hi, did you guys call me? Anybody <laughs> call for Raj? I'm probably going to go the other way. And here's this man wanting to go and, and, and lay his life down. Yeah, I, th I think another thing is that as a man of God, an evangelist and whatnot, he saw this as an opportunity to evangelize. 
to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. If he get a, what an opportunity. I mean, that's the best, probably structure-wise, the best in the world as far as talking to an audience. And here would be an opportunity to tell this audience about Jesus. So he's like, I'm ready to go in. And besides, what's the other thing? He's the guy who said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like I'm a winner both ways. That's the way Paul would see life. And that's the way a Christian needs to see life. I am a winner both ways. And this is what I mean now, because probably you're not going to be called tomorrow to rescue somebody with your life who's getting persecuted for their Christianity. Probably that's not going to happen to you tomorrow. <laughs> probably. How do you apply this then, you guys, to your life? And the, the answer is basically... Um, Every trial, um, every issue, every area of challenge, every part of your Christian walk that you would call um, hard or difficult or too much or I don't understand this, those sorts of things. You, you know what I'm talking about. This is the, the heart of a man or a woman who's courageously existing in Christ. You take on that challenge in your life as if God has a stage waiting for you with the perfect acoustics. I know that, that metaphor is a little out there, but still, you have, you have an opportunity to do something just because of that in, a situation in your life. There's something so unique. Paul, you see, Paul would never have had an opportunity to speak to 25,000 people at one time. Now, if he would have heard them say something like, Paul's blood, or we want to murder Paul, or something like that, and he would have said, no go, no way. What an opportunity that he would have allowed to fall, uh, fall to the side. What, what an opportunity to perhaps speak life into those who are destined for hell. And this is the kind of heart that a Christian, this kind of faith and courage and boldness that a Christian is supposed to have so that when your boss comes to you and starts laying accusation after your accusation, what is your response going to be to your boss? Is it going to be, you know what, get out of my face? Or is there going to be something about the way you're going to respond? You're going to say, you know what, boss, I'm going to do a better job next time. In fact, you know what, right now, you tell me what you expect to see right here. Go ahead and give me a deadline, and I will meet that deadline, and I will do an excellent job. Maybe that's your stage. Maybe it's a marriage issue. Maybe right now one of you is being hard-headed. There's something about you. You won't give in. You won't yield. You won't humble yourself. I don't know what the issue is. Well, how about that as the opportunity? So, you know, what are we trying to win? We're not trying to win. Uh, we're trying to die for our spouse. We're trying to build them up. Man, Missy is, she's called my weaker vessel. I'm supposed to present her as pure. Who am I to win anything? And so if I'm being hard-headed or whatever else, whoa, look out. But maybe it's something like that. You just have to say, you know what? I am so sorry. I just, I seek your forgiveness. I have no justification for putting up a fight here. I have no justification for being as hard-headed and prideful as I am. Not only do I ask you to forgive me, but I want to actually do it precisely the opposite way. Have I been speaking rudely to you? Here's one promise. I will always say please every time I ask you something. It just changes. It just cha now, you're not faking it. <laughs> not faking it. But you guys, every, every opportunity is a stage in Ephesus, man. 25,000 people. Is that the way you're looking at your life? You go ahead and take it before the Lord. You say, Lord, what's my Ephesus? What's my riot? And then as God answers, say, I'm going in. I'm doing it. Okay, with all that said, we know that Paul actually didn't go into the theater. Okay, his heart, though, was straight up right on. Now, it just so happened that God intervened because that's what God does. 
you maintain the heart of Christ. You maintain courage in Christ. And you know what we started this whole study with? The Spirit leads you. God leads you. So you're just about ready to go in, and you know what God does? He sends some other guys to come to you and say, Stop! Wait! Don't do it! No, this isn't the right time! And apparently, Paul trusted these guys enough. Apparently, they had a close enough relationship. Apparently, God united their hearts in such a way as Paul actually said, Okay. I mean, man, to me, it just seems like Paul was chomping at the bit, like his mouth was watering trying to get into that theater. And yet God says, you know what, son? Do you remember that I have Rome waiting for you? Remember that I have Jerusalem waiting for you? That, to me, son, is more important right now. You guys, you just have to have the heart. Be willing, be ready, and the Spirit of God will lead you. Okay, so then what happens here towards the end? It says, some of the crowd prompted Alexander, this is a bummer, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. <laughs> It's crazy when you look at it, but what is the thing that set him off? The fact that he was a Jew. I mean, that's the only fact you're given here. That he is a Jew is what set them off into this riot. Has anti-Semitism existed for a little more than a couple hundred years? Yeah, yeah. Probably a few thousand years. And I would say that's what you're seeing right here. God's people, always in the crosshairs. So, anyway... Moving on there, here are the last bit, a uh, few verses. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does, how did he quiet the crowd, by the way? What did he do? When it quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Now, they thought that she literally dropped in from Jupiter, uh, that Jupiter dropped her into that area upon which they created the temple. You'll hear the so-called scientific answer, this is speculation, that it perhaps was some kind of meteorite thing, that they actually did see something fall and they chose to build, you know, to build around it. But that's what he's referring to. So he says, um, uh, fell from the sky, verse 36. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly." For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So some sort of government official, that's who he was. And what he was referring to was the fact that Rome, they didn't take kindly to riots. They went to those cities that had riots, man, and they, uh, they tightened the screws on them. Like they put the clamps down. And so he was saying, if you guys continue, Rome will have to respond. And believe me, you don't want Rome in on this. So that would have got him to go, oh, yeah, okay, you know, okay, all right. So that was one thing. And then another thing, Christian, for you and for me, he, he has neither been sacrilegious nor blasphemers. He has done nothing to offend you as an Artemis worshiper, nor has he done anything against Artemis per se. What, what, the, what he's trying to tell you is what Paul has emphasized is Jesus. What Paul kept on doing was not attacking people, but trying to proclaim his belief. And that's what we allow. He proclaimed his belief. 
He didn't come at you with anything. He didn't go and try to destroy your temple. He didn't do anything like that. And that's why it is okay. Be rational. Be thoughtful. He just wanted to share his beliefs and his thoughts. So let's respect him for it. You know, um, that is definitely the method of the Christian evangelist. No sacrilegious stuff. You know, we're not going to take some idol of theirs and draw, you know, spray paint a cross on it and say, here you go. We're not, we're not going to worry about going to their, to the um, watchtower headquarters and picketing them. No, I'm going to go to that person and say, let me tell you the truth. Let me explain to you the truth, the gospel message. It's called the good news, and let me tell you why. That's what I'm going to do as a Christian. That's what you're going to do as a Christian. We don't, we don't ever want to um, heavy-fisted. You don't share the gospel with a heavy fist. You share it with an open hand. And this is the difference a lot between Christianity and, and other religions. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's disappointing to see those, you know, who are a little condescending as Christian evangelists. They kind of like roll their eyes like, oh, please, how could you not get it? <laughs> it's, it's demeaning, it's insulting, and that'll stir up a riot. But when you can just say, I just want to be able to tell you my truth, and then it's up to you what you do with this truth, I'll tell you what, that is often the best way. It's the best method of sharing the gospel message. Um, Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I think that's something that Christians, we need to, <laughs> we need to really seize um, often. Um, I want to encourage you guys in, in some of these other things as well. Uh, what is so unattractive uh, for, for a Christian um, is, a, is a Christian, <laughs> I wrote it like this, is a Christian with a chip on his shoulder. It's, it's really, really, really ugly. It doesn't fit when you have the wonderful creator, mighty counselor, wonderful God as your savior and as your Lord and you're walking around with a chip on your shoulder or you're daring anybody to take you on when it comes to your faith or whatever else. Um, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing and it's also a very dishonorable thing. You go, you go very presentable to those people. I need to as well. Uh, people will say things that I know is just outright lie about my Lord, and I can, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And the Lord has to really hold me back, and I have to yield. Lord, I'm sorry that I was about to, you know, take them on. And then be able to just share, Holy Spirit, I need words, because right now the words I want to say, <laughs> Pastor Rod shouldn't be saying and the Lord will, he will honor that prayer as well. Paul was cool. I, I like the fact that he wasn't sacrilegious because he sure could have been. He wasn't a blasphemer to them. He sure could have been. Instead, he just wanted to proclaim the lovely truth of a lovely God. He was led from stem to stern. So you guys, that was the, that's the message. Paul's about to leave Ephesus. This is it, two and a half, three years in the city. Where, where something amazing happened. He was able to teach and preach and plant this evangelical center of the, of the European, uh, I mean, of that um, region. And like I said, the effects of all of that, long lasting. Now, let's not talk about what Ephesus, what happened to them a little later. <laughs> we'll just say that they were very receptive to what Jesus did. Um, so number one, let the Lord lead you. Okay, day in and day out, let the Lord lead you in your walk with Christ. Um, secondly, I'll, I won't put this in a particular order because these are the words that I remember, is um, be bold, be bold in your faith. Be bold in how you share. Be bold, but always with love. Another thing was to know, to, to understand the master of that person who's in Satan, to understand so that you have words to speak back to them things that you can say that are relevant, things that'll make them think, things that'll make them talk and ask questions. Don't be arrogant in your presentation. Don't be angry. No chips on shoulders kind of a deal.
be very humble. I think God is calling every one of us to be humble in some area that we're all fighting against. There's something in every one of us that we're all fighting. And God says, as long as you're going to stay prideful there, I'm not taking you to the next step. So be humble. Seek after the Lord to lead you in that and then give in. Jesus, I'm here for you. Forgive me and lead me on. That's the kind of thing. And then finally this, be, um, be uh, um, courageous. That was the word, be courageous. Hey, whatever the problem is in your life, whatever it is in your heart, just remember it's an opportunity to stand on a stage somewhere. You get, a, you get an audience of 25,000, whether that means you have to humble yourself, you have to say something else, whatever that might be, go to the Lord and ask him, show, show me, Lord, where is it this time and I will. Whatever the trouble is, I'm going to look at it differently. I'm going to look at it like a stage, not as, you know, not as a, a hatchet coming down on me. And the Lord will honor you for that as well. Okay, church. Well, with that said, let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. We're